optical billing, the do's and the don'ts. I'm Dr. Guy Yatros. I'm Dr. Richard Drake. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, we're still thawing out down here in South Texas, Guy. It's uh, it's cold out there. I, I had to go to my office early and we canceled all our patients, you know, when it gets icy and the roads get icy. We don't know how to drive on that stuff down here, so we got to cancel everything. Uh, well, that's... Uh... Talking to the wrong person when it comes to that, huh? Yeah, I live in Florida, but it's supposed to actually get in the 30s here, which is uh, quite quite unique. We're going to get started. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Guy Yatros. I'm a partner there, Richard Drake and I. have been doing this a long time. Uh, we, we have several hundred, I think, pushing 300 people registered for this tonight, so we have to mute everyone. Uh, if you want, have questions, please type them in, and we and our team will answer them as we go. And uh, if uh, you know, into the, the questions end, box, yeah, into the questions you. box. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, and we'll answer them as we go, and we'll, we'll answer them out uh, verbally too at the end. So we'll stay on as long as needed to get to all your questions. So uh, tonight we're talking about one of what we call the pillars of dental sleep. Uh, you've heard us; uh, those of you who've heard us talk before, you know that we 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 feel that dental sleep is. Uh, not that difficult to do, but you got to have a lot of systems in place to do it. And if you have a system for screening your patients, testing the patients, treating the patients, and billing the patients, you're going to uh, treat as many dental sleep apneic patients as you want. So today we're going to hone in on uh, on the billing uh, pillar of the four pillars today. See, it's Florida here, Rich, so we, we thought we'd put some sand in, in the… A beautiful, uh, <laughs> beautiful picture. What's this in here for? You know, the I think the hardest part about this guy, you know, in the billing is we, we just get used to billing for dental procedures and what we're doing. And we have to realize that we're crossing a line in the medicine now. And I think that's really hard for, for a lot of uh, offices, you know. But again, that's why we're here tonight to learn about yeah, and I think you have to understand uh, there's a lot of different ways to bill, and we're going to try to give you the big picture of the, the, the various methods you can do and some of the do's and don'ts, as we already uh, mentioned. But you have to understand it's different. It's not the same. Dental billing does not equal medical billing. You can be the dental billing expert. Uh, it doesn't really qualify to do medical billing. And you even have to think about this differently. Uh, in dentistry, we're expected to be paid in full. Uh, I think most practices, whether you're fee-for-service or you take plans, you're expected to be paid by the patient their portion. Uh, and if you don't get paid in full, you, you declare that to the insurance companies. That's what the third parties mean in this uh, slide. In medicine, anybody who's ever been to the doctor any amount of time, you realize that they oftentimes charge a lot more than they collect. Uh, their collection rates are lower. Uh, if you uh, if you argue a little bit, if you can't afford to pay it, uh, they'll reduce the fee depending on your plan even too. Uh, and and the, and sometimes they don't collect uh, the patient portion of of the of the plan. And uh, at you know, all, at all, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And the ADA, the American Dental Association, Rich has a an opinion on this. I think we should mention that the ADA and the AMA will talk about their organization, their volunteer organizations. I think we should certainly listen to what they have to say. But they, your your state board is really who. Who tells you what you can and can't do? But uh, does this look familiar? I mean, Rich, you and I have been a dentist about the same length of time, pushing thirty years each, right? Yeah, and that's what you had uh, summarized on the slide before, guy. But a dentist who accepts a third-party payment under a copayment plan is payment in full, without disclosing to the third party the patient's payment will be not be collected as gauged in overbilling. That that you hit the nail on the head, guy, when you said that's that's what we expect as dentists. You know, yes. we got that right out of the ADA Code of Ethics. And when we go to the next slide and you get what we, we take out of the AMA Code of Ethics, you know, you, that should raise your eyebrows a little bit if you're a dentist and you've not done medical billing. <clears throat> but like you said, Guy, you know, as I get older, I'm a patient more, right, mm -hmm. than I used to be 20 years ago. And and a lot of times they don't even ask me for my copay. You know, I'm like, how do you guys stay in business like this? But again, they don't give you a treatment you know, plan when you come in? Yeah, right. No, nobody even. Yeah, you know, how much is this going to cost? I don't know. You know, we yeah. we just do it. We bill your insurance. You know, I, I mean, pay or don't pay, we don't care. So, yeah. But but you know, when a copayment is a barrier to needed care because of financial hardship, you know, physicians should forgive or waive the copayment. So, again, you, this isn't guy's opinion. This isn't you know Rich's opinion. We got these right out of the 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 code of ethics books that do that. And like guy said, you know these. This isn't the sheriff in town. The state board is is who can enforce some of these things and do this. But uh, again, you have to think about it differently. 
You do, and uh, and and especially if you're going to work with physicians, which you have to in dental sleep. And really, what it comes right down to is, is the patients want to know that their insurance is paying some portion of this. If you just say, I don't deal with insurance, which is one way of doing this, and we, we'll talk briefly about that. But patients want to know, hey, I have insurance. They want to use it. And they want to know how much is costing them out of their pocket. Uh, and again, uh, oftentimes, they're used to not even asking that question when you go to, to medical offices, because oftentimes you find out about it afterwards. So we could spend all day on, on that particular subject, but we just want you to get it through your mind and get comfortable with the idea that it's a, it's different than dental billing, it's different than medical billing. And the better that you manage your medical billing, the less a patient has to pay, the more you're going to do. And the happier your patient is going to be, the better your referral sources will be. Uh, so managing insurance is important. Uh, again, we do a lot of these series. Uh, we uh, Every other week or so, we, we, we talk about different subjects. And Rich and I have been uh, friends and partners for about 10 years now. We've been doing dental sleep independently, about 20 each, I guess. So probably pushing 40 years between the two of us now and done thousands of devices. I'm the, the guy on the left uh, of your screen. And there's yeah, Rich. More here. Yeah. <laughs> I just cut I mine off in the picture. A <laughs> little bit. I'm going to have to get some, some sheen for my forehead or something there. Uh, we'll yeah, be we have been we have been doing a long time and and we don't know everything but uh you know somebody asked me a guy the other day how do you know that i said because i've made that mistake before so mm -hmm. yeah we're uh, we're going to be talking in a few weeks so if you're signed up for this webinar you should likely get a notice it's on uh january 30th so about every three weeks we're doing these uh, on tuesday nights same time and we'll talk about the options with uh about getting your patients tested because Richard, I think that was the reason you and I started becoming partners. We started our business was because testing was so difficult to get our patients tested once we identified them. And it's certainly become a lot easier and you have choices now. And we'll talk about the various choices and what they mean to, to you in, in, in a few weeks. So hopefully you join us uh, at that time. We have some okay. courses. Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. No, I just, I thought that's what we were talking about tonight. I was getting ready to fly into that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. This is medical billing. All right. But yeah, we've got a lot of courses coming up here. You see those? Uh, we're doing uh, <clears throat> mostly two-day courses this year. Uh, you get a dental device. There's all kinds of cool things, man, that you get with this. Sleep I, test. I, a sleep test. Yeah, I think one of the cool things about this guy is when you do this, you really go back the next week and you really you know, we hear dentists say, I really feel like I can actually do this on a patient now. And uh, that that's unlike a lot of other courses out there. They're, they're, there's a lot of fluff out there. And we, we try to make our stuff kind of more meat and potatoes kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I can tell you, we have very positive reviews. People come to these courses, they leave there knowing, uh, having the, the, the information and the confidence to go back and get started treating patients. And that's uh, one of the reasons we gravitated a little bit more this year towards the two-day courses, because you really do feel comfortable after making your own device, having a sleep test. And uh, uh, they're, they're, they're normally uh, 9.95. And uh, if you, for attending this webinar, we you can save $200 if you type that in. Uh, by the way, well, I'll mention it one more time now since uh, a lot more people have logged on. If you have questions, type them into the uh, question box. Uh, and we will answer them as we go, us and our team, and we'll certainly get to all of them. We can't unmute the mics because uh, we have several hundred people likely be on here tonight. So a uh, big week coming up here next month, right? Rich, I know you got, just saw your flight reservations. You're flying in for this uh, whole, all weekend. I'm excited. We, we've, we're already – Pretty good group of people talking and all that. We've already surpassed last year, so I think we're going to have over 400 people, you know. So, um, yeah, if, if you get a chance to, to, to get there, uh, it's in Clearwater, right, Guy? Beautiful place to be in February yep. at the Hilton, a nice place to stay. And, and, again, a lot of this is just good meat and potato stuff that, that we talk about. For those of you who are, who, are, who are new to dental sleep, these are some of the, the country's really practical dentists. All these dentists that do dental sleep, and they teach you kind of like we do here tonight, hopefully, uh, real practical information you can go right home and use. Uh, last bit of housekeeping, your CE certificates will be emailed to you within 24 hours. So uh, if you don't see it, check your spam folder, folder because uh, if you signed up for the webinar, you'll get your CE certificate within uh, 24 hours. So all right. There's the four pillars. Uh, we want to mention that we'll, through the next few webinar series, we'll go through a lot of these other steps within the four pillars. And that's all there is to dental sleep, is just kind of putting the pieces together. And I think that's why, why people enjoy 
uh, our, our, our webinars or our, our courses and DS3 because we help put those pieces together so that you can get a patient from screening to treating in less than an hour of, of your time as a dentist uh, and delivering quality care to that patient. And I know when I first started doing this, that was far from the truth. It's been hours because we didn't have good systems in place. And we can, uh, we'll, we'll touch on a lot of the other things that we can do to help you in, in future webinars. So I think we just start off, Rich, with the, some big high level do's and don'ts, and we'll get into more details as we go. Uh, I think this is a, a new approach for us to kind of really just lay it out there, the things you absolutely need to be doing and the things that you absolutely don't need to do. I like that. Uh, and we, we have a wonderful support team, you know, at, at uh, Dental Sleep Solutions. And a lot of these people come up with some of this stuff for us because, you know, insurance guy is one of those things that you got to, you know, you got to have your finger on the pulse all the time because it's a moving target. You know, it changes. So uh, remember that every plan is different and, and you know, there, there are differences in parts of the country. So th these are generalizations that we're going to talk about. And, and then we'll also talk about, you know, how to get into a little more of the nitty gritty. Yeah, and uh, the, the little key points, we're going to talk about third-party billing in a second. Uh, you're going to need to decide Medicare status. We'll talk to you pretty quickly about what we think there. You need to keep it simple. I think that's probably that's what we uh, strive every day to do, document the cases, accept assignment of benefits and arrangements, and I th uh, financial arrangements need to be made. And I think if you look on the right side, we'll get into each of these, uh, so I don't need to read them to you, but just don't quit. I like the last one. I think, Rich, you probably put that one in there, and that's uh, it's easy to get frustrated uh, with this, and just don't quit, because your team can be really excited about this if you do it well, and your patients can be happy, but I can tell you, if you go back to your office, and you tell your 20-year your uh, veteran dental billing insurance expert, you're going to do medical billing, uh, this is the way they're going to feel. They're going to say, you know, uh, this is totally different, and uh Good luck with that conversation because I don't think it's going to go <laughs> quite the way you want. And I think the point really is that we need to do what we do well. You know, Rich, I have a rental condo down on the river uh, just a few miles from here, and I needed to have some, some ceiling fans put in there. Now, I put ceiling fans in, you know, usually get shocked a few times, and I have to run 15 times to the hardware <laughs> store. And I have to, you know, I don't have the right tool for this. I didn't have a tall enough ladder, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, you know, I'm getting smart in old age. I've got a guy that's a carpenter, and you know what? He has all the tools in his truck to do this, and he did it in an hour and a half, put in three ceiling fans. It would have taken me the better part of a day to do it, and you know, not that I can't do it, but why would I do that when I can be doing what I do? All these things on the screen, we're comfortable doing. We do them well. We're trained to do them, and if we can be doing that, why should we be doing other things like doing our own plumbing and you know, building our own houses and flying our own airplanes, or if you get Sue, are you going to, you know, be your own attorney? Uh, not to say you couldn't do it. Sure, it's legally allowed, but I think we've got to be smart about what we do, and at least when you get started. And, you know, if you want to do things yourself, you're going to find yourself failing here uh, with it. Medical billing is not dental billing. I think the number one thing we want to get across to you is, is to hire an expert. If you don't know someone, uh, you just email us. We're going to give you your email address at the end of the here. Just type in uh, the question, and we'll we'll hook you up with some third-party medical billers. We have some, one of our own called Four Pillar Billing. Uh, we have other ones we work with, and I, I can tell you that this will make your life good. And if you start doing a lot of this and want to learn, then sure, you're doing 20 cases a month. That might make sense, right? Yeah, I, I certainly think you can learn how to do this. Just like Guy said, he can learn how to put a ceiling fan up. He can learn how to be more productive and efficient at it. Well, you can with medical billing too, but remember, you, you know, that slide, a couple slides ago, guy, don't quit. This is probably the biggest reason that dentists quit because they file a claim or they don't file it right, or they don't get an authorization when they should have. And now they have to eat some of this, you know, and they don't feel right with the patient because the financial arrangement was screwed up. And, and two or three patients into this, they just throw their hands up and go, oh, I quit. The, the billing is a big part of this, and you can learn how to do it, but but don't do it certainly for the first six to 12 months. And Hire somebody. Matter. It's well worth it, guy. I mean, how much would you have saved putting those ceiling fans up? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I just said the whole day. I mean, it would have taken me way longer to do it. I could have done it. He ran into problems with the boxes not being to the right size and, you know, just stuff. He's an expert. And I can tell you, the other thing about dental bill, uh, medical billing is it's changing. We're going to show you some slides of Medicare's changing some things. And if you're not doing it every day, you may not know about these changes. 
and then it may come up and, uh, and be, be a problem for you. So, again, just to hammer that home, you can do lots of things if you put your mind to it. I mean, we can do things like this, you know. Where do you find these slides? <laughs> I think Jason found these for But look, <laughs> isn't this an easier way? You hire a guy with a forklift who knows how to run that forklift, got it all organized, and that's what we do at Dental Sleep Solutions and, and also your third-party builders. They're going to help organize this and make it efficient for you. It just doesn't make sense to do things yourself sometimes. So I think we've hammered that home as much as we need to. Uh, it, it, and we're really truly not saying that to be self-serving. We have a whole list of third-party builders you can that we work with and do a great job, and, and they just focus on dental sleep. So uh, I know some of the questions that we often get, Rich, after these, what, what is DS3 and what is Dental Sleep Solutions? What do we do? Well, this is what we do. We provide education, uh, coaching, and support for the what we call the four pillars we already mentioned, screening, testing, treating, and billing. So we, we help offices do dental sleep. I go to work every day with about 15 to, well, just shy of 20 team members that all they do every day is get up and want to help dental offices succeed in dental sleep. And if you need uh, more information on that, you can just type in consult. And if you have challenges, just a specific question, just type in consult. One of our uh, team members will get a hold of you. They'll hear what your challenges are, give you some solutions, and tell you how we can help you in the future. With uh, I think you'll find it's worth your time just <laughs> type in consult at any time today. So let's talk about these decisions, Rich. I think you're, you gotta you're figure, you got to figure out what you want to do with Medicare. You know, there's a couple of options there, and then everybody in or out of network. I mean, you know, guys, some of us old dentists don't even remember. You know, we weren't a part of this. You know, some of us uh, in, in the early days, even dental service organizations. Now, everybody's kind of we're having to make these decisions about if we're in or out of network. And again, we're talking about a net medical network system. And then we want to talk about, you know, how you bill for this and, and when you bill for it. So that that's kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Right. So uh, do's and don'ts. Do decide, I think, is the number one thing. Okay. Uh, I think the people who, when we go and we, we do the consulting with groups as well and, you know, well, why aren't, we, why aren't we taking off of this? And when we look at their medical billing, they're all over the place. Well, we haven't decided about Medicare. We're, you know, we we bill accept assignment on some people and other people. We we just don't have a system, and I think it, not having a system and an understanding of how this handled, uh, whichever way you want to do, it's better than all over the board. And I think deciding is key. Uh, and we'll kind of give you our bias on this tonight. Uh, but, uh, you know, every market, every area is a little different. Every practice is a little different. It's decisions you need to make. So the first big one is Medicare. And uh, we did a whole webinar with it focused a lot on Medicare. And uh, I think when I talk about Medicare, Rich, in these lectures, and I know you too, don't you get the, the attendees when you say Medicare, their original reaction, oh, I don't want to deal with Medicare. Yeah. Do, you, do you get that from a lot of the dentists that don't know yeah, what's going somebody on? somebody out there said, you know, some dentist went to jail one time for not doing something right. And that, that's just not true. You know, I mean, you have to do it right. It's just like anything, uh, guy. You know, there's a risk when you put those fans up that you could get shocked. You know, you get, we, we, we know enough already. But I think you're right. Don't Don't be afraid of it. We can figure this out. I mean, we really can, you know, you, you can do it on your own or we can help you do it. Or there's a lot of billers out there that can help you do it. But uh, I when I first started this guy 20 years ago, I opted out of Medicare. I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but but I don't feel that's the right thing to do anymore, you know, because uh, pretty soon I'll be 65 and I hope there's still some very competent, qualified people out there that who want to treat me, you know. So, yeah, these people have been around. There are a lot of, uh, you know, our veterans and, and they've fought in wars for the country and they've done a, a lot of good things. So, um, you know, it's not it's not a welfare system. It's what we all pay into right. uh, throughout our entire lives. Every time we get a paycheck, you know, from somebody. So I, I, I think the right thing to do is to get involved and treat these people. I think the word we have uh, here for you today is perspective. You know, as you got, <laughs> you're getting closer to that 65, it's funny how we change. Uh, you know, we could spend, uh, you know, 30 minutes going into the minutia of these basically three options for Medicare, opt out, but participating or non-participating. But because this is more of a do's and don'ts, uh, we're just going to cut to the chase and say do become what they call a non-participating provider. Uh, write that down. Write that down. If you write down just a couple of things tonight, that should be one of them. 
become a non-participating provider. That's what you want to do. The other the, the other options are out there, and uh, you can watch one of our past webinars to, 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 to get the details on it. And, and why you want to do this is because, like Rich said, it's the right thing to do. We want to help these patients out, uh, and we want to you know help her practice out. And there's money there to be taken that why not take it? And if you're a non-participating provider, and once you get all the paperwork filled out, which uh, our third-party builder, four-pillar billing, can help you with that. They can get it all filled out, and they're getting those done in three to three three months or so is about how long it takes to, to get them on, a, on the fast side these days. But you get the approval. And once you do that, when you submit the claim or your third-party builder submits the claim, you tell them you don't check this except assignment of benefits. And what that means is the checks go to the patient, and the checks from Medicare are going to go to the patient, but you can charge a patient whenever you want. So if, if you want to go that route, then why not be a non-participating provider? At the very least, the patient's getting some money back uh, to decrease their overall costs just for you going through a little bit of hassle of getting the the uh, uh, the paperwork filled out. Now, Rich, plus, you plus, guy, you can balance bill that difference. So Medicare Absolutely. has all kind of A, B, C, D. I don't even know if they're up to Z yet or whatever they're up to. We're talking about DME here, okay? We're talking about the dental devices as a non-participating provider. You know, I had the hardest time remembering this guy as to who, when, which you, box you check and who gets what. How I remember it is if you don't accept assignment, you don't get the check. Right. It goes to the patient. So that's just an easy way for me to remember and maybe some other people out there. But uh, like you said, there's, there's money on the table out there. Uh, you know, Medicare in our region in the South, where Guy and I both practice in Florida and Texas, Medicare only pays $833 for this. Now, there are other different regions. There's four different four regions across the United States, and some of them pay a little bit more. But again, now we can balance bill. The patient has a secondary insurance, then Medicare will automatically file with that. So just just remember, our our recommendation is is that you become a non-participating provider, and then you can. Uh... Yeah, and I don't want this slide to be confusing. And when I put it together, I, I also want to mention on this particular slide, there's do's and don'ts throughout this. But this one is do either one. Once you become a non-participating provider, if you do accept assignment of benefits, if the patient has a financial hardship and they can't afford anything more than the Medicare, or if you just want to do this to help your referral base because a physician referred you to the patient, then you can go ahead and accept assignment of benefits and the checks will come to you. And Rich's rights around 800 and some dollars, but most people have supplemental insurance. So the 200 and something dollars will come. So you'll get a thousand dollars in our area, 13 something in other areas. So you can go back and forth between uh, accepting and not accepting. So uh, again, we could go that, spend the whole uh, talk on that, but the real take home message, I'm even going back to slide up, is that once you become a non participating provider, it gives you the options to either accept or not accept. One of them. Right. right. And why not to get, at the very least, why not don't accept it and let the patient get some money back in their pocket just for filling out some paperwork? So we think that's one of the big big dues. Here's uh, uh, where you do, you can do it different ways. I think the next, no, uh, the next. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, it. The, yeah. uh, the point I want to make on that guy is the 855S. That is the right. application that you right. have to fill out for Medicare to become a DME supplier. So remember, we're not, um, you know, think about if we were cardiologists, guy, you know, then, then we, we wouldn't really have this option because we would have to become a Medicare participating provider because 90 Five percent of our patients are Medicare only, right. so w without being too confusing, you know. But but you, there's a couple of steps you have to do, and with Medicare, it's the 855s. That is the DMA supplier application. Uh, I don't remember how many pages that is, guy. This is a little bit worse than the ceiling fan. This would probably be like uh, <laughs> replacing the bathtub in your bathroom, right? So I would just pay somebody to help you do it. Yeah, and we 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 do those, you know. Uh, a uh, half dozen of those or so, two or three a month, I know that we do through our uh, subsidiary four pillar billing. They do a great job with it. Just put, let them uh, handle. They'll tell you everything you need to get to them, and then they'll chase Medicare down, make sure that they get everything. And, and then, you know, you fill out one thing wrong, and the whole thing comes back to you. Uh, so that's why you, you really want to get someone to help you with that. Uh, and so, speaking of Medicare, 
Uh, and and I one don't of the know reasons, anything about this guy. How'd you find out about this? Well, I found out about this because of our our uh, third party billing company, Four Pillar Billing. They do you know hundreds and hundreds of claims uh, uh, a month, and you know they're 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 go to work every day to just bill for durable medical equipment for dental devices. And so if there's changes in those areas, they find out about it. And so this is yet another reason to use a third party biller because something like this you may not know. And so starting in April, Medicare, what before your social security number was your Medicare number. And for various, you know, uh, uh, HIPAA reasons, uh, security reasons, now everybody's going to be assigned who's Medicare their own specialized Medicare number. And so it's real important whether you're doing this yourself or you're doing it through a third-party biller, uh, starting April when those patients come in, you need to ask them, did you get an updated Medicare card? And if so, you need to, you know, get a copy of it and change the the number in your system. Uh, DS3, uh, we, we do tons of digital um, uh, uh, claim submission, and we're ready and capable to make that change so you can use the Social Security number until it's time to switch. So uh, make sure your software, in other words, is ready for this change too because it's actually different digits and uh, the, they have to be prepared to do that. What you can do to help in the meantime is you can contact Medicare uh, and if you don't have time to copy this link down or take a screenshot or a picture of it, uh, again, just uh, type into the, the box. Uh, someone will, uh, will uh, email it to you. But they give you free posters and uh, so forth to put up in your office to, to remind the patients that this is going on because they're trying to stop this uh, you know, train wreck from happening where all of a sudden people have the wrong cards and people aren't getting paid. So uh, yet another reason to uh, be involved with your third-party billers because we can uh, catch those things before you as an individual probably would even know anything about it. So. So in network, Rich, tell you know you're in network on some, right? So tell tell me what tell us your views on in and out of network. Yeah, well, you know, so certainly my I think our recommendation is to stay out of network as long as you can. But but pretty soon, if you were practicing in San Antonio, Texas, guy, and you you have Aetna insurance, for example, I'm in network, and your office is two miles down the street, and you were to go to try to file a claim with Aetna, Aetna would not pay you out of network because they have an in-network provider, me, in town right next to you. So out-of-network pays better, right? And it pays higher, but, but it's a more of a process of trying to get paid. In-network, now it's a lengthy process. You have to contact provider relations at the particular uh, payer that you're looking at doing, whoever that is, United Healthcare, Aetna, Humana, whoever that is in your area who does that. And, and they, you know, it's a pretty lengthy process to fill out this application. Um, I think some dentists have a hard time getting into medical networks. I think that's, uh, that guy, we've been lowering that barrier for some time now because there's so many more people doing this. And, and it, there is some specificity depending on what part of the country you're in. But you got to remember, you're signing a contract now. So yeah. if you're Aetna guy and I sign a contract with you, you're going to say, okay, this is what I need in order to pay you, you and I agree that I have to provide that with you, and then you tell me what you're gonna pay me. So I'm, I'm, I'm negotiating a fee along with this, but it does make the process easier once all of that is done. Yeah, and I think this, what's easier, uh, I'm not in network uh, with anyone currently, although we're thinking about it because of some of the scenarios you just put together. Uh, my understanding of why it would be easier is you know the allowable amount. So you could, well, right? We haven't gotten to that part yet, but with the billing part, but yeah. yeah. Because when a patient sits down and they say, they, they always ask the same three questions, guy. Will this work for me? How much does it cost? And what does my insurance cover? They always ask the same three questions. I do this 10 times a day, every day for 20 years, it seems like. Yeah. So, and we have to know what it costs. And if we, if we have that fee set, you know, at $1,000, 2000 whatever it is, whatever that fee is set at, then now we know what their deductible is. And in network, we all have lower deductibles than we do out of network. So it just makes the whole thing work easier. We, we can now with our financial arrangement, we don't have any what ifs or any type of scenario. We know exactly what it's going to be. Yeah, I, I understand that. There are some areas that some uh, it, medical insurances have uh, really put up barriers for dentists that they try not to let them be involved. Sometimes they only allow oral surgeons in, but far and away, that's that's not across the board. There are some areas that are like that. I, I do know that we have some some challenges in certain areas. Uh, out of network, I can talk about because that's the way we do this. And the big advantage is, I mean, uh, the allowables can be 
two, three, four, five times higher in certain cases. Not in general, but they're but they're almost always more. Uh, so you can get paid more. The problem is the deductible's more, and less has been met most of the time. So you got to balance that. Um, we don't really have a contract with the insurance, so we have a little bit more um, a leeway as far as writing things off and not and accepting assignment of benefits and things like that because we don't really have an obligation as much to the insurance company depending on how we file it. And if there isn't a rich straight down the street uh, that, that's in network, I can become in network on a per case basis if the patient has a huge out of network deductible, I can apply for what they call gap coverage. What gap coverage is, just remember this, they have a gap in their coverage. So there's no doctor in their area to treat them so you can become that in-network doctor on a per case basis. And it takes quite a, b a bit of work and diligence. And uh, again, uh, uh, these uh, your your billing company are really uh, good at doing that. And what most of the ones we work with will look and see, you know, which is better on a ca per case basis. So in my case, sometimes we go for gap coverage when the patient has a really high out-of-network deductible that's not been met. And, they have a, and they've met all their in-network and there's no one in my area. Uh, except we're starting to run into with one carrier, uh, there's an there's a, 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 a in-network doctor, so we're probably going to have to to look at becoming more uh, in-network with them. So those are the, the, the pros and cons of the in and out. And again, I think one of the things we said to start with is decide. Do something. And say, okay, if you're going to start with out-of-network, which we recommend, then commit to that. And then, you know, evaluate it, you know, as you're uh, – if you have your monthly or quarterly meetings and decide, is it time to make a change on this? But don't just be all over the place with any of this. So uh, billing systems, uh, I, I think that's really where you got to decide too because I think this is where patients get confused, the doctor get confused, the team members get confused because they just don't know how much to ask from the patient. They don't know how much to balance bill. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of confusion there. So what we tried to do here is make this kind of, into, into, into really like three categories. So um, fee-for-service, uh, Rich, that's how I did it in my dental practice for years. I mean, I don't think that's a, a big uh, 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 mis, uh, mystery. Yeah, that's, yeah, most of yeah. us you just bill $10, you expect to be paid $10, and that's it. And then, yeah, and we, we can, yeah and, well, you can do that two ways. You can say, we don't mess with insurance at all. Right. Good luck. You know, file it your own if you want. Or you can say, we'll file your insurance, but you're going to pay us, and I have no idea how much you're going to pay. That's what I did for many years in my dental practice because that's what I did in my dental practice. And then I started doing that in my dental sleep. And what I found, I had more trouble with that with my same patients. They get a three-unit bridge, and then they argue over the, the medical because CPAP's covered. And then the physician called me up and say, what do you mean insurance isn't covering this? So uh, it's probably not my favorite way of doing it. I think that uh, it's simple. You won't get confused. Uh, and it's better than being all over the board. But if you want to get more people to say yes to treatment, then we might want to uh, accept the payments to come to us and work with them on their portion. Right, Rich? Is that uh... absolutely? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, you know, people want to know how much does it cost, and if you you got to know. So, uh, and I think I'm stealing your thunder there, guy, or later. But you know, the less a patient's going to pay, the more cases we're going to do. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not much more complicated than that. You know, maybe you live in an area, a real affluent area, and, you know, you can do this and get away with it. If you can, great, but most of us don't. Yeah, and so when we accept assignment of benefit, that means the insurance portion is going to come to us. And if you're rich and you know what the allowable amount is, on, a, on a, I know you're not in network with everyone, but you're in network with some. So if you're doing an in-network patient, then we know what that amount is going to be. So we can just do the math and we can say, here's your portion of it. So that, that would be a fixed amount. The other would be that we just say, you know what, here's what we bill and we're willing to accept the risk for that. And if they don't allow what I bill, I'm not going to charge you anymore. Okay, that's, that's a way you can do it as well. Uh, but if you do that, you're going to take it on the chin. The other way of saying that is, well, look, if if they don't, if I bill this at two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred, let's say I bill at twenty five hundred and I only allow twenty two hundred, okay, am I going to collect the difference that we calculated because we miscalculated because we didn't know what the allowable amount was? Well, if I'm going to collect that, I've got to tell you that up front, and so uh, that's what that's, I mean. By that's more. the hard part, though, guy, because. Right. Because they won't tell us what the allowable is. Right. That's the hard part. They, they, they're making this as hard as they possibly can for all of us. And 
If we don't know, then we can't give the patient a, a straight answer. So now you got to figure out how to do this flexible billing system that guy's talking about. And I, I can tell you, guy, a lot of dentists are uncomfortable with that. But yep. um, if you want to be successful in dental sleep medicine, I don't see any other way than, than that. Yeah, And that's the way I do it. I mean, and, and just to kind of give the high level of that is, look, we're taking some risk. We bill a little bit more than we need because we're going to take it on the chin ever so often. And so we're willing to tell the patient, look, we've done everything we can to estimate what they're going to cover, and here's how much the most we're going to collect from you, okay? And if that doesn't, uh, uh, if, if we're wrong, then we, then we eat that, and that's why you have to, to, to some get more on some and less on others. Uh, and then the last part of this is the billing codes. I think our, our next slide, uh, let me see if that's right here, shows that. I, yes. Uh, the next slide, Richard, are you still there? I lost your video. I don't know if you were having a little trouble with your internet. Oh, well, maybe I'm on my own here now. I hope uh, everybody's still hearing me. <laughs> uh, let me just make sure someone tells me you're still hearing hearing me here. That doesn't say I'm having a problem. Can, uh, well, yep, good deal. You're fine. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I'll keep going here. So when I talk about the, uh, the keeping it simple, we're talking about do you want to bill for each code uh, that the patient that you possibly can? So in other words, you do an exam. Do you want to bill an evaluation and management code? Uh, if you do um, a follow-up visit for titration studies, do you bill, bill those evaluation and man management codes again? Some people bill for the uh, AM aligner and different codes. And uh, if you do all that, it's going to confuse the patient. Uh, you've got to make sure your documentation is very accurate because uh, uh, it's harder to prove you did those appointments. And our uh, do on this is do keep it simple and just bill for the dental device and lump everything into that one fee. Uh, the only exception to that is in my office, we do, do have a comb beam. And we bill that separately. So the only thing I really bill for, the patient comes in, we set a fee for all their appointments up until their six-month recall. Uh, Rich, I see you're back. That's good. And the uh, and, and, and if they if we uh, are, uh, choose to do a comb beam on them, then that's a separate fee. So two fees, keep it simple. Uh, if you get more advanced with this, you might consider doing more, but certainly until you really understand the system better, uh, keeping it simple. So can you hear me all yeah. right, Rich? Yeah, and I think, I'm sorry, I had to separate for one second. I, I think that's one of the things that scares uh, Dennis too, Guy, is, you know, well, he, you know, you just got to know that in, in medicine, when you bill for a certain code, there are certain requirements that you have to meet in order to bill for that code. Right. So that's why Guy said, keep it simple in the beginning. As you get more sophisticated and you move down the line a couple of years and you want to start billing, you know, a different part of Medicare or a different part of insurance for other other things, then, then you can do that. But keep it simple in the beginning. Right. And so prior to seeing our patients, we need we do need three things. One is I'm going to have a successful consultation. I want to check on their benefits. I want to know if they have coverage, how much their deductible is, how much has been met. May not be able to find out the allowable amount depending on in or out of network, but I'll be able to tell the percentages and co-pays. And you can find out a lot. And you can do this with a phone call. Uh, or you can do this with an instant eligibility check if you have DS3. Uh, DS3, we have over 4,500 billers, and at a click of a button, you can see a screen like this, which may look a little confusing until you know what you're looking for on here. But basically what we can find out is everything I just mentioned. There are deductible amount in and out of network. There are uh, co-pays in and out of network and what percentage uh, that, uh, that they'll cover. So with that information in hand, and a copy of the sleep test and the patient having their questionnaire filled out, I can have a really uh, good consultation. So I have to have those three things prior to the even consultation. And then, I mean, I think this is dental sleep in a nutshell, Rich. I mean, there's not anything hard here. Boy, there's a lot listed on the on the do-have side. And, and, and we're not saying uh, any of these are really optional. I mean, you have to have all this information on the left-hand side of the screen here before you're going to file a game. You've got to have a sleep test. You got to have a diagnosis. You've got to know what their benefits are. You have to have a letter of medical necessity and prescription from the physician. So it's a letter that says uh, this is medically necessary from, as Rich usually says, their best physician or their primary care. Uh, and you have to have a proof of delivery. When you give them the device, have them sign that I, it's durable medical equipment. 
uh, just like my mom did when she got oxygen for uh, COPD. I saw, she signed for the oxygen, and you have to have a way to submit it. So these are all, you absolutely always have to have these things. Guy, you don't have to have these. You just need them if you want to get paid. <laughs> yeah, that's that clear. So well, you can file a claim without a lot of this stuff. but sure. And you might even get paid occasionally, but if they come back and audit you, you know, right. um, you, you know, and we we do webinars, you know, about surviving an audit and things like that. And, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is just we put a little bit different twist or flavor on it because we get to spend more time on a specific topic. Uh, and that's really hard to do in an hour. We can't do all of that. But like I said, you know, go, go through your checklist. Do this. This is why what you pay a third party biller to do this is just not that much, you know, until you uh, can afford to you're doing enough that you can afford to hire somebody in your own office to do this, then you should be using somebody else. So, you know, the pre-authorization you may or may not need, um, you know, uh, I know in DS3 guy, we have a way to click a button. You can get eligibility benefits. What's their in-network deductible? How much have they met? What's their out-of-network deductible? How much they met? We got some really cool stuff that we've worked into our software and how we do that kind of thing. But, um, you, you may need the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's pa parameter papers on this. Uh, I haven't even had anybody ask for that for quite a while, Guy. Um, right. You know, the advanced beneficiary notice, that's, again, something that we use for uh, mostly Medicare patients. And I don't know how much time we have for any of that stuff. But, but right here, we're just talking about filing a claim. We want to get paid, and we don't want the insurance asking for their money back. Then, then do the always, and you'll be, you'll be much safer. Right. And uh, when it comes to documentation, uh, this is actually part of some slides Rich prepared for surviving an audit. And, and I think the big do here is do, 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 do very good progress notes, complete progress notes and document what you, what you have to do. And if you go by Medicare guidelines, which, so this isn't uh, wishy-washy, right? It's, it's written, they're, they're published guidelines. If you go by Medicare guidelines for all your patients and you do that, then you're going to be in good shape for all the other insurances in general as well. Wouldn't you say, Rich? That's the reason yeah. we had, you know, had this. So you, you're the expert on this. You want to go through these? Yeah. Remember, Medicare requires a face-to-face. -face. You know, it doesn't have to be their primary care physician. It could be their cardiologist or something like that. But, you know, again, these are Medicare guidelines. And what's happening is a lot of the other insurance payers are starting to follow these guidelines now. And, and then the sleep study needs to meet one of three criteria. So if their, their RDI is above 15, that respiratory disturbance index, how many times they quit breathing with a minimum of 30 events, then that's all you need, okay, as far as the sleep study goes. But if it's under 15, but it's still above five, now that's still in that mild range, uh, then you have to have a minimum of 10 events. And now we have to document some of these comorbidities. EDS is excessive daytime sleepiness, impaired cognition, mood, grumpy, right? Insomnia, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, you know, all of these types of things. And if the RDI is over 30, so now we're in the severe category, then they have to have at least tried CPAP or they have to say there's no, absolutely no way I can wear it. Uh, the MD prescribes the dental device. I'm prescribing a mandibular custom, mandibular repositioning device for my patient, Richard Drake. I'm referring him to Dr. Guy Yatros, right? And it's medically necessary to treat his documented sleep apnea and it's needed for lifetime. It's that simple. We just put those things on there and man, we are covered now. So, you know, right. interestingly, you know, uh, Medicare says it has to be done by a dentist as well. There are some physicians out there doing this and they're the ones getting in trouble for a change, you know, <laughs> when, when it comes to this. So um, yep. last but not least, you have to use a device that is approved by Medicare. And we'll show you our favorite two at the, at the end of this. So the only thing I'll mention is you don't have to have all these. You just have to okay. have one of those. I, I think you said it that way, but I want to, I don't want to scare anybody off and saying you've got to, so if the patient says they're sleepy, they're falling asleep at the will, they have an net worth above a 10, however you want to document that, that's good enough for having heart disease, which most of them have at least one of those two anyway. So it's not really hard to get them to qualify for this. It's just making sure that you document it, you write down those things. And again, that's for Medicare. These are Medicare guidelines. But if you follow that 
procedure for your uh, your private pay insurance, your, your commercial insurance, uh, you're most of the time going to be in, in good shape with them as well. Uh, you have to have a diagnosis. I don't think yeah, you do. And the, the new diagnosis code is the G47.33. You know, older one was 327.23. You know, we, we're doing a lot of replacement devices for people on uh, Medicare now as well, Guy, you know, but you got to get them to last five years, you know. Um, we did have an interesting case, Guy, where uh, the dog chewed up a, a dental device and the patient appealed it through Medicare and they actually got them to pay for another one in less than five years. So there That's are good. a couple of instances where you can do this, but Medicare wants these things to try to last five years and sometimes that's hard to do, but... Uh, but again, you, you got to have that written order from the physician. We talked about the requirements of that. You know, I, I, I went through that. Uh, if the, you know, again, this is coming from the physician, not from us as the dentist. So we, we I, I think, Guy, that one thing we have to understand, too, is sometimes we have to help the physicians do this. Right. You know, I actually write the letter for them, and I put it on their letterhead. And then we put that little gummy thing across the top and we, <laughs> we, we put a hundred of them together and we, we give it to the office, you know, so that now that they do that, um, you have to keep that on file for, you know, seven years and you, you have to have this advanced beneficiary notice on file as well, which isn't that big a deal. But again, you got to remember too, that you have to, um, you have to establish that it's medically necessary to treat this. Now, your progress note, Guy, you said you got to make a really good progress note. It doesn't have to be really long. It no. just has to be really good. So like Guy said, they don't have to have all of these comorbidities, but we do have to document some of that stuff. If we document that, if the physician documents that, if the the primary care doc does, the cardiologist does, then there's no question at all whether or not we need to treat this sleepy patient. And we do this through templates too uh, in our DS3. So, you know, you make a, we supply you with the templates and then it, it uh, you also gather data from where the patient inputs it. So it, 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 it really isn't difficult to write a good note once you know what goes in it. And again, I think that's real key. They don't have to be long. No one no one wants to read just for the sake of reading. Important, concise information that we need. And then when the uh, the, the delivery, proof of delivery, uh, you know, I used to always take a picture of this as a proof of delivery, and then I realized you have to, this form is a better way to go, and Medicare actually says they need to sign this. So it's just like if you get a wheelchair or oxygen, uh, any other kind of durable medical equipment, Medicare wants the patient to say, yes, I received that. And even though uh, it's a little different, we fall under that same same category, and you can see the uh, the list of what needs to go on that uh, pr uh, proof of delivery. And I think we have a slide coming up that says this, but in case we don't, the big one there is, too, do not bill them until you deliver it. Medicare and most of the insurance companies are very specific that I know a lot of dentists bill for crowns the day they prep the tooth, and that's acceptable in the dental world, but in uh, and dental sleep, it's the day you, you hand them the device is the day you're allowed to bill. And a, and a really quick aside, Medicare store, we had a patient die before we delivered the device and uh, wrote a letter to Medicare saying, you know, we'd already done the work, we'd pay the lab, and they paid us uh, mm -hmm. as an exception. So, you know, I mean, I think Medicare's, you know, I hate to say it, but fairly reasonable. If you document things well, they're not trying, they're, they're wanting to help the patients and the providers. And you just got to, you know, dental sleep is nothing more than, having a system and being organized and, uh, and, and putting the, the right things in the right boxes. So, Very uh, good. And that, that's what this advanced beneficiary notice is, Guy. That's exactly what this is. This is designed, it, let's say I am 65. I know I look like I'm 70, but I'm really only 56. But let, let's say I'm a Medicare patient and I go in and you say, hey, we're going to make you this dental device. It's wonderful. We're going to do all of this and uh, Medicare's gonna pay everything and you're gonna be fine. And then you give me a bill for $4,000 or something like that. So the advanced beneficiary notice is just designed to protect the patient so that the patient knows what he will be responsible for and what he won't be. And, right. and you've, got, you've got what that is right there, right? I mean, you, you, you need to know what that is. Uh, you can get these, again, you can type in consult, we can provide these things for you. There's. Uh, our, our medical experts and our billing, you know, companies are 
a lot of people out there can give you this kind of information. Yeah, and it's a standard form, but uh, knowing how to fill it out is the key, and we can certainly help you with that. If you have questions on that, just type in consult. One of our uh, experts from Four Pillar Billing will we'll, uh, yeah, answer any questions that you have there. So the dues, uh, again, as on insurance documentation, is we want to know who ordered the study. Uh, if it's Medicare in particular, uh, it, should, it better not. It's not the dentist. It needs to be the the best their physician, the primary care or sleep physician. Uh, same for the diagnosis. Same for the prescription, and same for the medical necessity. Uh, we we don't write these letters. We don't uh, order the sleep study, uh, especially for you know Medicare patients because Medicare says uh, that it needs to be from the physician. So if you follow those guidelines, those dues. Uh, on all your patients, and sometimes you don't have to for commercial insurance, but if you want to, you know, suspenders and belt all the time uh, kind of a person, you're going to stay out of trouble. And I think the don'ts are probably as important uh, as anything else. I mean, like Rich said, don't file insurance without the proper documentation. You might actually get paid. Uh, it's what's a little different, too, about medical billing is uh, they, they sometimes pay and then they check the information. In dentistry, they they look for the they want the X-ray. They want everything first, and then they pay you. And then it's uh, they don't usually come back with an audit. Uh, with medicine, they may pay you, and then go, hey, you know, let's go check Jack Drake's chart and see if he had everything he needed uh, for for oh, that you're last. You're the guy asking him to do that, huh, guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you had an audit, and you did fine because you had all these these things in order. And and, and it's really not scary if you have if you have everything uh, that that is specific. Uh, yeah, and there's, there are a couple of questions about that ABN guy, the advanced beneficiary notice. Okay. I would I would recommend you just do it every single time. Just do it. You know, accept assignment, don't accept assignment. It doesn't matter. Just if you have it every single time, then it's just part of your paperwork and you don't have to go, do we do it or not do it? There are instances, you know, occasionally where you don't, but we do it every single time. Okay. And the, the couple of things on here, some insurance carriers do have some little rules that are slightly different from Medicare, especially on mild patients. They sometimes uh, don't cover mild patients and there are different things. But so uh, your third party builder will know those uh, for you. But if you're doing it yourself and you, you want to read what their guidelines are on occasion, you'll write, run into something slightly different. Uh, some uh, You need a pre-authorization a lot of the time. And if you forget to do that, you're dead in the water. If you've gone ahead and and, and sent a claim and they said, oh, you needed a pre-authorization. Well, then you can't unwind that. Uh, you've just lost the coverage. Uh, and I think really important is don't file for these codes that you don't understand. Don't say you, know, you, you went to a webinar and they said, oh, I file this code and it's some weird, you know, whatever code. And if it doesn't make sense to you and you don't understand what the criteria for that code are, do, do not file it because you're going to get in trouble if you can't back that up with your documentation. I'm not saying uh, that there aren't other codes. I know it's a double negative. There are codes you can you can legally use, but you need to know how to do that, and that's billing, you know, 505, not not 101. Um, and, again, let's don't wait. Let's don't give the uh, – submit the claim until the device is seated. Uh, Richie, I think due to time, we're not going to spend a ton on this. So uh, we'd have a whole webinar on – devices. And I think that we'll just keep this short to the, the two devices that Rich and I recommend uh, for Medicare patients. There's a couple others out there that I just don't think are, 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 are ones that I feel comfortable doing. Uh, basically, they're on the screen here. They're your HERPS devices and your TAP devices. And uh, if uh, you know you wanted more information on, on which ones are better or worse uh, for, for different patients, you know, take a screenshot of that while I have it up there. Uh, but we have a, you can go to our YouTube page and we have a whole um, hour video on, on devices and we'll probably repeat that before the year's over as well. So there's your tap, the different versions of the tap and why we might use the, the tap because I'd like to uh, make sure we have time for all the questions here uh, at the end. Again, dental sleep is not complicated. I shouldn't say it's not hard. It's, it is complicated. There's lots of steps. There's lots of you know, you've got to do this and pieces to fit together, but none of them are hard. It's like putting together a, a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, it's most of you can do it, uh, but you got to, if you put it together a few times and you learn quicker ways to do it, uh, you can become very efficient at it. That's what we do at DS3. We help you with the systems that you need. Rich and I as dentists decided there was a need for this about, I, I was looking at the other day, Rich, it's been about 10 years ago, uh, you know, that we decided, wow, you know, why, why can't dentists do this? Why aren't we gaining any traction? And we decided to try to put uh, a system together, and I feel like we succeeded in doing that, to helping dentists uh, uh, be successful. And success is 
to me, helping your patients and going to work every day and enjoying what you're doing. But you can't be successful uh, in a business unless you make money. I mean, uh, it, 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 that's part of how we measure ourselves. And, and it really, you have to be successful because you, if you want to pay your team members, I mean, I think about our, you know, uh, 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 all of our team members at DS3, if we don't do a good job and we don't help people, then we, that they, they can't have their kids go to soccer camp and all that stuff as well. We, we have an obligation to our teams to bring in money uh, and to do a good job and to continue to be a productive member. And I can tell you there is nothing you can do in dentistry to add more production, uh, more income than adding dental sleep. I mean, it's, it is the look at uh, that. guy. If you take a month off and you just do one a week, you can almost add a hundred grand to your, your bottom line. That's after you pay for a third party biller and DS three and everything else. And the device. And those are all very reasonable. I mean, we're looking at 2,500 device, which is a very, you know, average amount. I think that's very reasonable. You people say you can get 7,000 for these, you know, look, let's be reasonable. 2,500 is a fair fee for this service. 350 is a fair fee for the lab costs. And if you're, Third party pillar is doing a good job of collecting that money. A couple hundred dollars is, you know, is, is a fair amount. So we're not, we're not really, you know, skewing these numbers at all. You do one a week, and you've added almost another six figures. You know, ninety thousand plus dollars uh, to your bottom line. And uh, and so, what's that going to be? Forty five minutes a week of your time to do to do one device. And it's going to take a little bit more of your team's time, and we'll we can help train them on that. If you if you're interested in learning how to put this into practice. Um, and how to, uh, to help your patients, or, or even if you're already doing it and want to do it more efficiently, uh, then just type in consultation. Just consult. Uh, if you if you have a specific question, if you want to know more about the ABN, or you want to know, you know, you have a specific a TMJ problem, anything that we think we can help you with, one of our team members will get on, and, and we promise that we will help you understand your challenges and give you solutions. And then, uh, of course, we can also tell you how we can very efficiently uh, help you be successful with this. So just type in consult and we'll be happy to do that. Uh, set up some Jody, Brandy, Lisa, someone will get a hold of you tomorrow if you do uh, type that in. Uh, I just saw your insider uh, article, Rich. Just I think that's coming out in a week or so, right? I love that magazine you guys put together there at DS3. It's it's amazing. There's a lot of good stuff in there. You know, it's a digital magazine, which if you guys haven't uh, seen that yet, you just click on the pages and it shows up. Guy usually does videos uh, in there, you know, we show you how to how to add to the wing or how to fix a device and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And I don't know, Guy, how many, how many issues have we done now over... Over two dozen. Yeah, we've done over two dozen. They're lining the halls of DS3 there. We got fr them framed, and uh, I think it's pushing 30, if not over 30. I, I don't know. If that's a good question, but I know it's over two dozen. Uh, we do this every other month, and, you know, here's the best part. It's free. So if uh, if you want the next issue, just go to, to the website here. I've got the video camera covering up. I think it's dentalsleepinsider.com, and you can see the past issues there too. We Like Rich said, everything from Medicare questions to – to how you uh, how you add a, to the wing of a dorsal to 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 uh, practice I like question. a couple months ago like I, I like that one that Jameson Spencer put in with the video of the joint clicking oh, that, and popping and stuff that, that was pretty cool I, I use that uh, verbal skills that he taught me during that all the time so it's a great uh, sign up for that if you want uh, and you'll get that free at your inbox and then again if you want to be successful in dental sleep you just need a system for screening, testing, and treating and billing. And there's little systems that go inside of all those we've mentioned, and uh, that's what we've figured out. And we will help you through education. Uh, we do in-person education. We also do webinars. We do uh, team training, uh, part of our system. We actually just train your team with live teachbacks. Uh, we coach. You have specific questions, uh, challenging cases. We have every other Wednesday night. Uh, Rich and I have another webinar it's just for our members, and we open up the mics and we talk, and it's like a nice study club uh, meeting that we do there. So we help you with all your challenges there. We have the most efficient software that makes the patient experience and our um, uh, our efficiencies in our office to, for all this to flow because dental softwares just don't they, they don't house this information. They don't help you do this, and we have a really robust cloud-based software that helps everything from billing to letter writing. And then we're here for your support. I mean, uh, we have a phone number. We have uh, people on call uh, five days a week. And if you have dental sleep billing 
questions or to clinical questions, we can help you with all that. So if you want to learn more, type, again, type in consult. Um, we're adding quite a few more courses. So even if these dates aren't where you want, uh, just type in course to secure a $200 off. I mean, it's only $9.95 uh, for the two-day course, including a device for yourself made by the lab, uh, including a sleep test. In most cases, uh, we're, we're having a sleep test at these courses. And uh, so, you know, you're down to $7.95. Uh, to, to come to the to the course, uh, I promise you. Uh, whether I teach it or I rich, I thought that was a typo, guy. I know you got mad last time we saw it. Was, yeah, it's pretty pretty inexpensive. Uh, I do most of the courses. Rich does some. When they come to me or Rich, I promise you, you'll leave saying, you know, this. If you want to learn dental sleep, uh, we have overwhelmingly uh, high uh, scores on this. People come and just say this was a great use of your time. I hate wasting time. I've been to many, many CE courses where I'm like, why did I take this time out of my schedule? I promise you, you'll you'll, you'll leave there saying this was, whether you're a neophyte to this or you've been doing it for a while, you're going to leave with a, a great experience. So even you if might, those days... You might even be treating your own sleep apnea when you leave there, guys. A lot of times. Yeah. yeah, these sleep tests reveal... Uh, one year, Rich, wasn't it like 60% of the dentists that were tested? Because 63% of the dentists. Something like that. Yeah, we, we went back and looked. So it might even save your life. I mean, we've had right. patients who've, we've had dentists who've come and we've got letters where they say, you know, if I hadn't come to this course, I, I don't know that uh, I would be uh, be around for that much longer because they find out they have really severe apnea. So uh, again, if those updates don't work, just type in course and we'll We'll let you know as uh, uh, Jason's getting the finalization of some more courses coming up. Uh, in a few weeks, we'll be talking about sleep testing, uh, one of our passionate subjects because it really is what br brought Rich and I together uh, to become such partners and good friends. And, you know, our wives probably aren't real happy because we've worked way more than we used to. But uh, <laughs> uh, that, that subject brought us together. And we're going to be happy to kind of share with you how how that's changed and, and what's really exciting and, and new and, and uh uh, out there. Here's how you get a hold of us. Uh, so, uh, info at dentalsleepsolutions.com. And look at that, Rich. 901, not not bad. Uh, uh, we're, we're happy to stay on here. Type in consult, type in course. Unless, uh, I know, Rich, you've been answering some of the questions. The team's been answering the questions. I, how we doing I haven't that? answered a single one, guy. I mean, huh? we're, our insurance team and these guys are good, man, at answering this stuff. So, I was looking through there. There was a couple of things about the advanced beneficiary notice, which I think we cleared up. A couple of things about modifiers. Uh, let me see anything else. You know, uh, Dr. Rash Werger said, you know, hey, hire somebody to do it after trying to fill that Medicare form out for two days. Uh, so the, there was a question too, Guy, about, uh, you know, the gap exception, maybe being another dentist was too close. So, you know, about 50 miles is reasonable. You can uh, appeal that and sometimes they will, uh, you know, make an exception if, if you know, they, they certainly won't do it if somebody's just down the road, but. Uh, yeah, it's a little less than that. I know I've got somebody in St. Pete and that's about 30 miles from me. So I don't know what the exact number is. This is somewhere between 30 and 50, I think. Uh, I tried to argue that it's, you know, I think they went by, you know, crow's fly, uh, you know, because it's not far. Right. I can see St. Pete, but it's a lot further, but I didn't get very far with them. So I guess I'm going to have to become a <laughs> <laughs> COVID network. So, uh, yeah, let's say we got a couple more here. Uh, yep, I see they're, they're answering those. Uh, what are we allowed to write off of medical insurance and not get in trouble if audited? Uh, well, that's a uh, that's a, a, a good question, and you know, the, my answer to a lot of things. If you come to our course, uh, you'll get you'll get a lottery ticket. Uh, you know, if you if you get the answer right, because we give away lottery tickets, and the answer is it depends. That's the answer to everything. You know, so well, what are you allowed to write off? Well, it depends. Uh, uh, you know, you need to make a reasonable attempt to collect, and the patient has to say they have a financial hardship. And as long as you don't now, if you're in network, it might be a little different because you may have signed something with the insurance company saying, "I agree to collect this." But if right. you're out of network and you make a reasonable attempt to collect, and the patient has a financial hardship, then you can write off anything you deem fit, including the deductible. Uh, and I can tell you, we're a lot more diligent about documenting that stuff than the, the physicians are. I mean, I went to have my knee look at re recently, and it's a, you know, a physician I know, and he's just like, ah, oh, you know, just give me this, you know, and they build my comp insurance a lot more. And they just took, they didn't, they, they just, it just happens all the time in medicine. And I, I don't agree with the system. I don't think it's the, 
you know, uh, but it is the system. And I think what I learned is you have to learn to play within the system we're given unless you have more uh, ability to change the system than, than Rich or I do because we, 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 we've not been able to change the system. So the answer is it depends as long as you document it and as long as you're uh, 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 I think you hit the nail on the head guy there. Yeah. You know, a reasonable attempt to collect. We yeah. just, a lot of times we'll have the patient write a note. Hey, these are the things going on in my life. I know, um, you know, I agreed to pay this, but I just can't, you know, and then we write it off. So we've documented financially up front what we tried to get them to pay. And then they write that. So that, that's a good answer. It depends. You know, we got to figure out what we're going to do, but yeah. Very good, guy. You put together a wonderful uh, PowerPoint there, as always. I thank you for doing that. Well, thank you uh, th uh, for your uh, your part there, too. And I look forward to the one uh, in a few weeks on, on sleep testing. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a big crew like this. And again, if you signed on a little bit late, you'll get your CE in your email within 24 hours. If it's not there, check your spam before you... Um, Start emailing us. Start emailing us with <laughs> questions, but uh, you're always welcome to email us. We're, we're here to help. That's, uh, I think, you know, we get up every day and we're proud about what we do and we're happy to help in any way we can, even if uh, uh, your, your, your DS3 is not, uh, you're not a member of DS3 yet, we'll be happy to help you if anything we can. So just uh, uh, contact us there if you need anything. If not, uh, maybe uh, you'll see us in our DSM Insider. Uh, don't forget about the symposium if you're, wanting to get out of wherever is probably colder than here. <laughs> in February, uh, it's right on the beach. It's a nice uh, event uh, just after, right around um, uh, Valentine's Day. I think it's the 15th is the date. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see you at one of those things soon. And I think all the questions are answered there, Rich. What do you, yep. do you think we're good? All right. All right. We're good. You guys have a great evening. Thanks all again right. for being with us. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye.